Hey everybody, Jay Winters here. Uh, today we're going to start off our uh, series through the uh, 100 Bible stories, and we're going to start off talking about the prologue stories, which are the, the first foundational stories of the Bible, and uh, we'll be taking a look at those and seeing how God sets up what the Bible is and what his message is going to be about in these, these stories. So the stories that we're going to be looking at are Creation Days 1 through 4, Creation Days 5 through 7, um, Adam and Eve in the Garden, the first sin, we're going to be looking at the curse and the promise of a savior. We're going to be looking at Cain and Abel, uh, this whole chapter of genealogy in Genesis 5. Then uh, the story of Noah and the flood. And then finally, the story of the Tower of Babel. And um, uh, and I'm going to be trying to get this done all within 15 minutes because I found out that the thing that I use in order to make these uh, times out after 15 minutes. So let's see if we can do it in 15 minutes. Here we go. Um, uh, all right. So we're going to start off with creation stories and creation stories are amazing um uh, the creation stories tell us how god created the, the world and uh, and uh, they really give us an insight to who god is and so we start off with the creation of the cosmos so the the creation of the cosmos is the creation of all of the things that are going to support animal life all of the things that are going to support human life so as almost as god gets started he knows that who he's creating this for he's not creating the world so that you know so that puppies can be around uh, he's creating the world so that human beings can be around and uh you know he's not creating the world so that there can be trees in it he's creating uh, the world so that human beings can engage with those trees and it's a really interesting thing to see the way that god is already setting up what is going to be the most important thing in his creation it's also interesting to note that god creates through his words that all god has to do is say let there be and there is and so he says things like let there be light and there is light and let there be you know uh, sun and moon and, and stars and heavenly bodies and there they just happen and it's important to recognize that when god says something it happens sort of like when you're in church and, and speaking on behalf of god i speak god's words to you and i say you know things like you're forgiven in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit and uh, and that happens and uh, the thing to recognize in those moments is that god's word is really powerful and and so when we speak god's word to one another when we read god's word that it's really powerful stuff it created the entire universe as we move on we're going to talk about the creation of animals so those uh, those next stories about um the creation days five through seven are about the creation of animal life they're also about the story of god resting on the seventh day so during this time god creates fish and he creates uh, birds and he creates human beings uh but then he also takes a moment to rest he takes the seventh day and he he takes that day in order to rest to model to us what it looks like for us to rest so that we can know that one day we too can find a rest we can find a rest uh, in things like sunday morning where uh, we can go to church and we can hear god's word and we can just kind of take a break from everything that's going on around us that's what sunday morning is supposed to be about it's supposed to be this moment of resting in what god has done for us in what god has created for us and and recognizing that god didn't need to rest uh, you know god didn't get winded at the end of day six and say whoo that was enough for me but rather that god was like oh you know what they're going to need to know that uh, that they need to rest and so i'm going to model that for them i'm going to show them what it looks like to rest and so on that day god does nothing um God simply communes and he recognizes the, the beauty of the creation around him. So after that, we're going to get into the creation of human beings. Um, so the, the creation of humans is this important thing that happens on the sixth day. And on the sixth day, God, God creates the crown of his creation, which is us, which is human beings. And uh, not only does um, uh, God uh, you know, create human beings, but God creates human beings by getting his actual hands dirty. Uh, you know, um, it says that, that God forms man out of the dust of the ground. And so there, there's this sense that uh, when when God creates humankind, what he does is he does it you know, uh, through manipulating matter that's already there. He literally gets his hands dirty. He, instead of just speaking us into being, 
he actually uh, works with us. And, and that's important for us to know. You know it, it, he, we have this special place in God's creation where he even creates us in a different way. So he creates Adam by, uh, by, by forming him out of clay. And then he creates, uh, he creates Eve out of uh, taking a rib or maybe even uh, the best way to think about that word, if you look into the Hebrew, is like a whole side of Adam. And so you already have there like this picture of marriage that, uh, that uh, male and female are, are two separates, but they're meant to make a whole. And, and so you have this great thing that's happening throughout the story of scripture where, uh, where that is what marriage is all about. That's what family is all about, is that these two holes are coming together and uh, two halves are coming together rather in order to make a whole. And so from there, uh, we, we get the next series of stories, which is our fall into sin. So unfortunately, it doesn't take very long for us to fall into sin. Um, and, and so that happens in the garden with Adam and Eve disobeying God. So God said, hey, there's one tree in the garden that I don't want you to eat from. And a serpent comes and the serpent comes and says to Eve, did God really say and it's important that, you know, that that's one of the ways that Satan works w with us, that he, he makes us question. He, he makes us kind of question what we know from from God's word. And he says, did God really say this? And Eve actually comes back and, and she says something interesting. She says, well, God told us not to eat of it. He also told us not to touch it, which God never actually says. We, we don't have that recorded any place. And so Eve actually makes God out to be almost kind of a, a little bit more strict than what uh, he, he really is. Um, and sometimes we do that. Sometimes we make God to be more strict than what he really is, which is unfortunate, but it happens, I guess. Uh, and so anyway, they, they do commit that first sin. They, they eat of the, the tree that they're not supposed to eat from. And then um, out of that, they feel what we would call contrition. They, they feel this, this moment where they feel sorry. They feel shameful. Um, and they know what they have done is wrong. And that leads us into the next story, which is the curse and the promise. So the story of the curse and the promise is that uh, God recognizes that Adam and Eve has, have sinned. He goes into the garden and he says, where are you? And they say, we didn't want to come out because we're naked and we're ashamed, which that immediately, you know, God says back to that. Who told you that? Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you should be ashamed? And it's interesting to note here that that's who God is. God doesn't want his creation to feel ashamed. He doesn't want us to feel ashamed. That's why he sent Jesus so that we could acknowledge our guilt rightfully and say, hey, we messed up. This is not good. Um, uh, but he doesn't want us to feel ashamed about that. He wants us to be able to come to him and not feel like we have to hide from him. So anyway, there's consequences to sin. And unfortunately, the consequences for Adam and Eve's sin are things like they're going to be frustrated in their work. The childbirth is going to be painful, but there's also a consequence for the snake. And the consequence for the serpent is really important for us to note because that serpent is Satan. And what God says is that there will be one who is born who will crush Satan's head. And that's the first promise that we get that God is going to send Jesus to us. He's going to send somebody who's going to rescue us. And he's going to send somebody who's going to be our Messiah, the promised one who's going to save us from our sin and save us from all temptation. So from there, we get the first generation of human beings that are living under that curse. And so we've got Cain and Abel, the first generation of people um, that, that are living after Adam and Eve. Uh, they're actually living along with Adam and Eve. And, uh, and it, it, you can tell that th something isn't wrong here because uh, Cain and Abel, they, they're in this moment where they have to give a sacrifice to God. And, uh, and Abel brings um, uh, some, some meat from his flocks and Cain brings some vegetables. Now, we don't really know why it is that uh, God looks on Cain's, uh, Cain's sacrifice and says, I don't like that, and Abel's sacrifice and says, I do like that. But we can assume and kind of read into the story a little bit and say, well, God knows their hearts. And so, uh, you know, because of that, God must have known something about Cain's heart, that Cain wasn't offering the best of what he had, or Cain was offering it begrudgingly. He, he wasn't really, his whole heart wasn't in it. Uh, and that Abel was the other way around. But because Abel was 
uh, was loved by God and because uh, Abel, uh, because that was accepted, then um, Cain gets jealous. And because Cain is jealous, he decides that he's going to kill his own brother, um, which sets us up for the story of the rest of humanity. So now we're going to get into that story of the early world where we're looking at that story and we get the stories about the early world and what it was like to be a part of that and that's where we get this genealogy this story uh which isn't really a story it's just a listing of who was born um by who and it gives us this sense of like a really interesting stuff including that some of the people in there live a really really long time Methuselah is the oldest person recorded um, in the Bible he lives for 969 years uh, that's a really long time and people think that part of the reason that they're doing that it, it, they're living that long is because they haven't been you know humanity hasn't been subjected to sin for that long so it's like their dna is better dna than our dna is um and so um they're living longer and and it shows that they're also living longer and so they're able to better populate the earth and so they populate the earth with a whole bunch of people and that's when we get that long story of noah noah and the flood which goes for several chapters it goes for four chapters but as Essentially, the story goes that um, there's this guy, Noah, he's one of the only righteous people that's left. So sin has been working its thing. It has been making things terrible. And now there's really only one person, only one family that God really looks at and says, well, OK, you're, you're actually following what I want you to do. And so because of that, God rescues Noah. Um, and unfortunately, this is a really dark story. I know we put it in uh, children's books and, and all sorts of other things, but it's a really dark story. Most of humanity dies because um, the consequence of their sin means that they are going to die in, in, in a drowning death. And uh, But God still preserves humanity. He still holds on to humanity and to the rest of his creation by saying, I do want to save a remnant. I do want to save a section of these people. So from there, we move on to our final story for today, which is the Tower of Babel. So the Tower of Babel is this story about uh, actually about God's grace, uh, which it doesn't seem that way at first. So in the Tower of Babel, you have all of these different people and they're all able to speak the same language. This is you know, long after um, uh, long after. Noah has uh, died and gone, and the, the earth is repopulated again, but the same stuff is happening. And they're trying to uh, do stuff that doesn't make God happy. Um, they're trying to do stuff that actually makes them more important in the eye, in their own eyes than, uh, than in God's eyes. And, and so God looks down at their puny little tower. Um, if you read the scripture here, um, it's funny the, the way that uh, when you, you hear about the way that the humans talk about it, they're like, oh, this tower is so big and so great. And God looks at it and he says, let us go down there and take a look at this. Sort of like, oh, that thing, we can kind of barely see it. Like, let's go and, and take a look at that. Um, and he stops them. He stops them from doing it. He confuses their languages and creates several different language groups amongst them so that they won't be able to get together and sin together anymore. So he says, I, I at least need to break these people up so that they're not going to destroy the entire earth by their sin. And so if they're broken up, then they won't be able to destroy the entire earth that way. So that is the story of uh, the, the uh, whole entire rest of uh, the, the prologue. Um, uh, what we'll be looking at next time is we'll actually look at 12 different stories. Um, it's going to be um, a, a long bunch. These stories are available um, just down there in, in the description. But we're going to be looking at the call of Abraham. We're going to be looking all the way down to um, Joseph's promise. So it's about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also about Joseph, who is um, Jacob's son. So thanks for being along with us for this journey. Um, we hope that we continue to get better at presenting these stories to you, um, but continue to read them, continue to have fun with them, and we'll see you with the next video.